My problem is I don't know everything. And I think any lexicographer has to be on guard against letting his own preconceptions, his own ideas, be taken mm -hmm. as necessarily true. Those of you who are familiar with the first edition of the Lovren Pronunciation Dictionary will know that 10 years ago I conducted a survey in order to get to grips with this difficulty. I knew, for example, that I usually call the black and white striped animal a zebra, although British dictionaries, generally speaking, say that it's pronounced zebra. So I asked a lot of people, and I found that 80% of them in Britain told me that they like to call it a zebra, and only 20% like to call it a zebra. That gave me the confidence to give zebra as the first British pronunciation in the dictionary. Uh, I know Americans still say zebra, but it was clear that Britain, in Britain we were changing. Well, it's time now for a new edition of the dictionary, so also time for a new pronunciation preference survey. The 1998 survey was carried out about a year ago, and it incorporated a further 100 words of uncertain or dubious pronunciation. Well, who do I ask about this? <coughs> It would be nice, in a way, to take a random sample of the, popu of the population. But the difficulty is that if you ask somebody chosen at random to fill in a long and difficult questionnaire about pronunciation, most people are not interested, they haven't got the time, they haven't got the motivation. So <coughs> instead, I targeted the people who are interested in speech and therefore have the motivation to do it. So I contacted the speech conscious, those who have views about pronunciation, because those who have views about right and wrong don't necessarily all have the same view about what is right and what is wrong in pronunciation. I was fortunate in being invited uh, a year ago in September to give a speech at the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science held in Cardiff, where they had a session on linguistics, and I gave a talk about well, about current changes in British English, and the result was that I got a lot of press attention. All the main newspapers, the Times, the Guardian, the Independent, the Telegraph, wrote about this, and I encouraged them to mention this questionnaire that I was preparing, and to invite people to write in and ask for copies of the questionnaire. I was also interviewed on the radio, and the result was that uh, something over 2,000 people contacted me uh, to participate in the survey. Now, I laid down requirements that people must have been, they must be native British, that is, they have to have lived in Britain between the ages of four and 14, the crucial ages for when language is established. By Britain, I mean England, Wales, and Scotland. So some of the people who contacted me were eliminated because they had spent part of the time in Ireland or Australia or the United States or France or somewhere else. And we got eventually 1,932 people who met the criteria. Each of these 100 items in the questionnaire was uh, in the form of a multiple choice question where you had to choose one or two or three or sometimes up to five different possible <coughs> options for your answer. And the instructions were Please indicate the pronunciation you prefer. Usually, this will also be your own pronunciation. So I didn't actually ask people, what do you say? And anyhow, we know that people are not good at reporting what they say. They often are inaccurate. But I asked them which pronunciation they prefer. And with that wording, uh, well, I hope we've got useful results. Here's an example. What's the name of the continent? I call it Asia, but I was aware that a lot of people call it Asia. So here's a multiple choice question, two possible choices. You notice that I present the options in three different forms. First of all, in an IPA transcription, then with a, an exp 
explanation of the sounds involved. The consonant sound is that in pressure, or the consonant sound is that in measure. And then I present it in a respelling form. So people who are familiar with phonetic transcription can use a phonetic transcription. Other people can, we hope in this way, understand each time what is wanted. I got no complaints that the questions were obscure, so I think we succeeded in getting across the information we wanted. Well, how do you think people voted? How would you vote if you had to vote for Asia or Asia? Put up your hand and vote. Who votes for Asia? Shh. Put your hand up if you vote for Asia. Nobody? Who votes for Asia? Everybody. Well, <laughs> see how the British compare with you. I divided the results according to age group. You can see there on the left those born up to 1933, so the oldest group. Then those born between 1934 and 1953, that includes me. Then those born between 1954 and 1973. And lastly, those born since 1973. And uh, you can see the percentage of people who chose one answer or the other. The shh, my pronunciation, Asia, you'll see, is going down. It starts over three quarters of the oldest people prefer it. For my age group, about two thirds of them prefer it. But for the younger people, it's only about one third. So we've had a swing away from Asia to Asia. So you're all well ahead of this trend. <laughs> Of course, you may be influenced by American English, uh, Americans doing the same thing, usually. Well, there are various trends that can be observed uh, among the data I collected, among the, say, the, the, the findings that I made. Uh, one thing that older people often say is that the young people don't know how to pronounce the language properly anymore. And people often write to the newspapers or ring in to the, new, to the uh, radio programs phone in, to complain about young people's pronunciation. And there is some evidence of this in the findings I have. If we take the word that I call nuclear, nuclear energy, it's widely considered that the correct pronunciation is indeed nuclear, but that there is an illiterate pronunciation nuclear, which is a competitor for it. Indeed, uh, this so-called illiterate pronunciation has some eminent users. President Eisenhower was notorious for using the pronunciation nuclear uh, and avoiding nuclear war. Well, the corresponding British nuclear is likewise <coughs> a competitor for nuclear. Well, if you look at the top graph on the left there, top left, you will see that indeed for the oldest three age groups, pretty well everybody prefers nuclear. But with the youngest age group, with the youngest age group, there is a sudden shift. Well, it's not the majority by any means. Uh, it rises as high as 14%. But there is that increase uh, among the young for preference for nuclear. Nevertheless, nuclear clearly remains preferred. The second graph, the lower one, shows the traditional pronunciation mischievous, stressed on the first syllable, confronting the newer pronunciation, or the formerly stigmatized pronunciation mischievous, with stress on the second syllable. And then we find a rather bigger change. Among the older groups, yes, everybody, nearly everybody from the oldest group prefers mischievous. But when we reach the youngest group, those born since 1973, you can see that actually a majority of them say that they prefer mischievous. So here the pronunciation that used to be stigmatized and regarded as incorrect is nevertheless preferred by a majority of the youngest group. Well, it's possible that as they get older and wiser and more educated, uh, they will change their view. And so, in another 50 years' time, we may still find those people now in their 70s and 80s prefer mischievous. But I don't know. I rather suspect that we won't, and that we are seeing a gradual.
actual change in the preference for this word. A change that everybody comments on in Britain is the declining status of received pronunciation, by which they mean particularly that younger people are no longer ready to acknowledge that received pronunciation is necessarily the best pronunciation. On the contrary, many younger people see received pronunciation as old-fashioned, as fuddy-duddy, as not having the qualities of street cred, street credibility, which they see as important. So again, it's interesting to see if we can document this in the findings of the survey. One of the ways we can see this is by comparing regional pronunciations with those that are received pronunciation, which by definition is not regional within England. And uh, this graph, these two graphs we see here now in front of us demonstrate this in two words. The first is the word that I call chance, the chance of doing something. Now, like the Americans, in the north of England, uh, most people use a short vowel, the same vowel as cat, and say chance. It's not qualitatively quite the same as American English. Americans say chance. In the north of England, people say chance. But it's the same vowel as cat and the animal for those who use this pronunciation. As against chance in the south of England, and in received pronunciation, which is different. Well, I ask people which they want. Do they like the R vowel chance or the A vowel chance in this word? And you can see that among the oldest age group, 80% of them voted for chance. <coughs> but among the, among the youngest age group, it was down to only just over 60%. Now, the proportion of northerners to southerners was pretty constant across the age groups. So this can only tell us that northerners are increasingly reluctant to admit that the southern and to receive pronunciation chance is better than their own pronunciation. The oldest people are, even if they say chance themselves or grew up, grew up saying chance, they're ready to acknowledge that chance is the preferred form. The younger people are not prepared to make that acknowledgement. So what we see here is a, an increase in overt preference of regional pronunciation. It's also possible that there's a slight increase in Southerners who have a local form chance and receive pronunciation chance. A few Southerners, a few Southern youngsters voting out of defiance for a pronunciation that is different from that of their parents. There is a very slight increase, in fact, among Southerners voting for, for chance, which can only perhaps be explained in that way. The second graph, the lower one, concerns the number that I call one. Now, in received pronunciation, as in American English, this has the same vowel as a gun that you shoot someone with one. But in the north of England, it's often pronounced one with the vowel the same as my name, John. One. So the question is, do you prefer one, or do you prefer one? And here again, we see that for the oldest people, there's a 80% or more preference for one. And as we get to the younger age group, the size of the majority gets smaller. Till for the youngest people, it's only less than 60% who prefer one over one. So again, we see the regional form one increasing in popularity as we move to younger age groups. Again, it can only be explained as a reduction in deference an attitude of deference towards received pronunciation. Well, I'm concentrating, as you see, in this talk on the differences among different age groups, because these are what tell us about changes that are in progress. Another thing for which old people uh, stood out is their ignorance about new words. I asked about various new words in the language and how they're pronounced. So first of all, there is the computing word that tells you about the capacity of a hard disk. You might have a hard disk that is 
for, well now, are they gigabytes or are they something else? Those who know the word, in fact, call it a gigabyte. Computing people all call it gig. But the spelling is not altogether clear. The spelling might indicate gigabytes or gigabytes or e even gigabytes. <laughs> Indeed, the word gigantic gives some support to gigabytes. So I go, gave all the four options to people and asked them to vote. Well, you can see the results in that top graph. The blue line, dark blue line, is the voting for gigabytes. And that's clearly the majority in all age groups. But among the oldest people, it's only about two-thirds, slightly less than 70%, who know this, who know the word. Two-thirds of them, well, know. One-third of them don't know the word. And those one third uh, chose one of the other options. Interestingly enough, the youngest people, the under 25s, are less confident as well, perhaps because they are not all as computer literate as we like to think. And it's the 25 to 45 year olds who are most certain that this is indeed a gigabyte. I also asked them about uh, an ecological word. Do we call it an ecosystem or an ecosystem. Well, of course, we call it an ecosystem, those of us who use the word, and there we see a steady increase as we go from old to young. The younger are very interested in matters of the environment and ecology, and they know that it's an ecosystem. On the next uh, slide, we can see the word mall for a shopping mall. Now, this is not really uh, a, a wholly British word. The usual expression we use in Britain is a shopping centre. You build a new shopping centre. We have got the word mall on now, but it refers to certain streets. In front of Buckingham Palace in London, there is a wide avenue called the Mall, traditionally. Likewise, Pall Mall, where gentlemen's clubs used to be. So there's a problem here. We borrowed the word from the Americans, we're sort of borrowing it, but we haven't necessarily borrowed the pronunciation with it, and some people therefore call it a shopping mall, like the mall in London, others call it a mall. But as you can see from the graph on the left here, the older people are the ones who think it's a shopping mall. This was specifically with reference to the shopping centre. The younger people are more likely to know it's a mall, and among the youngest group, indeed, nearly 80% know it's a shopping mall. So again, the young are more attuned to Americanisms, as we can see here, with the American pronunciation. Uh, the other graph on this slide demonstrates the complete disappearance of a, of a variant. The whole list of questions that I was asking people about, what do we call this list? Well, nowadays we call it a questionnaire. But this is a word borrowed from French. In French it's pronounced questionnaire. And so it came into English with kes in the beginning, questionnaire. And older people, a few of them, voted for questionnaire. You can see it's about 20% of the oldest people, less than 10% of my age group, and virtually nobody for the younger, among the youngest group it was zero. So here we can see the gradual disappearance of this older pronunciation with the French influence, entirely now replaced among younger people by the anglicized questionnaire. Another very important influence on people's pronunciation is the spelling. The spelling indicates very often a particular pronunciation where the traditional pronunciation seems to differ from what's implied by the spelling, there's a pressure to change the pronunciation to fit in with the spelling. So here we've got three words which have traditional pronunciations, foreign, scholar, and falcon, where we see the replacement of these traditional pronunciations by a newer form, forehead, scallop, and falcon. The lower graph on the left is for this part of my head. I grew up calling this my forehead. My 
horrid. And when I was little, I learnt a nursery rhyme. There was a little girl, and she had a little curl, right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. Now, if you pronounce it as forehead, that rhyme doesn't work anymore. But that's what many people are doing. You can see for the oldest age group, it was about equal, forehead or forehead. But the younger people become, the more likely they are to prefer forehead. That's the red line over forehead. That's the blue line. Top right-hand graph shows a similar change from scholar to scholar. The red line is scholar, gradually being displaced by the blue line, scholar. For the 25 to 45 year old people, they're equal. Older people prefer scallop, younger people overwhelmingly prefer scallop. So scallop is what's taking over. I didn't specify whether this had to be the actual shellfish itself or other things with the same shape. It's used in dressmaking, for example, the shape of the shell. Uh, and one or two people wrote in on their answers that they would make a difference between the shellfish and the, the shape. Well, it's certainly possible that people might make that difference, but I think in the long run it will disappear and the two will be pronounced the same, they are the same word after all. Now, falcon is rather more complicated. Here the traditional form is actually falcon, like talk and chalk, with no L. My own pronunciation, falcon, has an L in it, but has the same vowel as talk and chalk and thought, thus L, falcon. Uh, there's a competing northern pronunciation, well, mainly northern, but not particularly, uh, falcon. Just as in salt, some people say salt, vowel of thought, plus L. Others say salt, vowel of lot, plus L. So in falcon, it can be falcon or falcon for this older pronunciation. But the new pronunciation cuts through all of this, falcon. Uh, and that's very strikingly different from all the other ones. We did have an American television series, Falcon Crest. Well, except it wasn't, it was Falcon Crest. And that was popular about 10 years ago. And it may have influenced people because uh, in it they always said Falcon Crest. On the other hand, in my view, it takes more than one television series to change people's pronunciation seriously. <laughs> After all, we continue to say Dynasty, although the television series was called Dynasty. <laughs> Well, be that as it, as it may, you can see uh, on the graph on the bottom right that the pronunciation, the rising line, is the green line for falcon. My pronunciation, the red line, falcon, falls steadily. And that's a way in which my pronunciation is becoming old-fashioned. <laughs> and it's, it's very important for us to be humble about ourselves and realize that what we do may seem funny and out of date to the young. Well, spelling pronunciation is one kind of regularity. There are other kinds of regularization as well. The compound that I call a newspaper obviously consists of news plus paper. So you might expect it to be pronounced newspaper. My pronunciation is unusual in that it isn't newspaper, but newspaper. And that's clearly irregular. So, I ask people, do they prefer newspaper or newspaper? And you could see that for the oldest age group, it was about equal, but the younger people were, the more they prefer newspaper. And for the youngest age group, it's two-thirds or more who like newspaper. This is good news for foreign learners. It means you can <coughs> pronounce it in the way that is regular according to the spelling and according to the morphology. Now, you know that uh, many nouns that end in a voiceless fricative are irregular. Knife changes to knives. In F to V, it's shown in the spelling. Leaf becomes leaves. There are some with S to Z, house, houses, not shown in the spelling, and therefore perhaps more difficult to learn. The same is true of the TH words. Mouth. Mouths, not shown in the 
spelling, but just the same kind of irregularity, voicing of the fricative in the plural. Well, so we teach people. Now, there are others where this doesn't happen. Cliff, cliffs, you don't hear cliffs. Uh, oak, you say oaks. Some people say oaks. Certainly, month, months. You know, it can be a simplification. You can lose the third and say months, but nobody says months. Well, some of these words then we're not sure about. Ask me what the plural of youth is. A youth can also mean a young man, so you can have several youths, I would say. But I've noticed that many people say youths. So I asked them about it. Do we prefer youths or do we prefer youths? And you can see that most people do still prefer youths, but the blue line is sort of falling, that's the lower graph <coughs> of the two, it's still way up in the 70% area, but it's not quite as overwhelming as it was earlier. So we're seeing the beginning of a regularization, perhaps, of youths from youths. Uh, those of you who know the first edition will know that I asked last time, 10 years ago, about the plural of bath, and found this a surprisingly large proportion of people voted for baths rather than baths. Uh, well, since then, I've had an American uh, survey which has shown a similar trend for bath. Baths is giving way to baths in American English. So this is something that's happening on both sides of the Atlantic gradually, bit by bit, by becoming regular. Okay, now to rather more complicated matters. The diphthong or comes in words like, well, there are the three <coughs> lines for yours or yours as it used to be. Poor or poor as it used to be, and sure or sure as it used to be. We're gradually moving away from or to or in these words. <coughs> this means that if what belongs to me is mine, what belongs to you is used to be yours. But most people nowadays say what belongs to you is yours. It means that someone who's not rich traditionally poor, can be poor. And poor, then, is the same as when you pour water out, or an enemy with its four paws. It means that when I say I'm certain, I can say I'm sure. It used to be I'm sure. And with the newer pronunciation, sure, is just the same as seashore or George Bernard. Well now, remember that my survey didn't restrict itself to speakers of received pronunciation. Indeed, it didn't restrict itself to the English. We know that this sound change is taking place in England, but there's some question about how general it is in Wales, probably not nearly so much, and we know that in, we know that in Scotland it isn't taking place at all. So we're not going to get 100% here. But I was quite surprised how steep the line is. The red line for uh, poor giving way to poor. You can see that among the youngest age group, over 80% voted for poor, even though there are Scots and Welsh among them who certainly wouldn't have that, would have poor or pure, or whatever it might be, uh, poor for those local pronunciations. And likewise with yours, well over two-thirds of people voting for or and uh, Shaw, two-thirds of people voting for it should be the same as George Bernard Shaw. Quite high figures then. I think this means the time has come that for those who are teaching a British English model, we should teach poor, Shaw, your. <laughs> I mean, after all, I'm age 60. To me, yours sounds old-fashioned. I say yours. So isn't it time that the only people really uh, under 50 whom one hears in England saying yours are visiting Scots or Germans or French or Poles or Japanese or other foreign learners. And it seems to me to be ridiculous that a pronunciation should remain only in the mouths, mouths in the mouths of foreign learners. 
It is slightly problematic, though, what is happening to Ur. We're losing it from the system, that's clear. But what happens to it? Does it always go to Or? Well, it seems not always. Sometimes it goes to Ur. And this is particularly striking in this difficult word spelled L-U-R-E. Now, historically, traditionally, this is Lure. But we don't like Lure. We're moving away from uh, absolute to absolute. Nobody says salute anymore, it's just salute. So we don't really want to keep it as lure. If we change it to lure, okay. Now we want to get rid of ur to or, that gives us law. But that's a homophonic clash that we're not very happy with. We don't want to law people in to something, well not many of us, relatively few. So um, the, another possible direction is to go to er and say lur. And in fact we have all six possibilities of lur, I don't know where it's going to end up, but briefly people are not very happy with law. I ask people about Jury, jury. Does it rhyme with boring? Well, some people thought it did, but uh, most didn't. The blue line, if you can see the blue line on the left, that's those who thought it rhymes with boring. And uh, it's less than 20%. Nevertheless, the people who feel that it doesn't rhyme with boring and doesn't rhyme with stirring, but it's different from both, falls steadily. So clearly it's going somewhere. If it doesn't remain with Ur, what does it have? One possible explanation is that we get this monophonal Ur, during, 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 which is nevertheless not the same as or boring, or as er uh, stirring, during. And these are the same people who don't have an Ur anymore, it seems, at the ends of words. So a possible explanation is that this long Ur can be reanalyzed as an allophone of the U phoneme, which of course normally is blocked from occurring before R. That's historically what, you, what it was. It will apply to words like furious, curious, during, and so on. And the same thing then is in the word jury. I asked them, does it rhyme with story? People will say, no, it doesn't rhyme with story. Does it rhyme with furry? Most people say, no, it doesn't rhyme with furry. Nevertheless, if it doesn't have the word, what does it have? It has oo, jury. It remains distinct for a majority, even of the youngest group. And this is a possible analysis then of what's going on. Well, back to clearer, more clear-cut matters. We know that ch is changing to ch. Daniel Jones, first edition of English Pronouncing Dictionary, says the word, the type one actually, is pronounced actually. We look at this now with a sense of wonder, because nobody really nowadays says actually. <coughs> Jones was a good observer, presumably he was telling the truth, but he gives a whole lot of pronunciations with ch that really are surprising, because we know we say ch. Well, of course, there are other words where even Jones didn't say ch, words like nature. Nature came in from French, something like nature. Great vowel shift, nature, nature, nature. And it's come to us as nature. Even Daniel Jones certainly says only nature and natural. So it's a change from kit and churn that has a good history, and it's gradually extending its sway. I was thoroughly expecting to find that in words where the ch is before a weak syllable, we should find this more and more among the younger people. So in a word like perpetual, my best account of what I do myself is that in careful, slow speech I can say perpetual, but in more rapid, everyday speech I normally say perpetual. Similarly with situation, situation. Now these are words where Americans have typically gone all the way to ch, perpetual, situation, you get ch. So you'd think you'd get this in British English very readily. Whereas the third word we see here, the green lines, the triangles, this is the word tune, where it's a 
distressed soul. Now, for someone of my generation and background, to say tune is very vulgar. Oh, not right at all. Somebody like me says tune. And here, of course, the Americans, uh, if anything, go towards tune. You don't get tune in American English, but you do in British English. And my big surprise was to find that among my younger respondents, they quite openly say they prefer tune over tune. So there's been a very definite change in preferences <coughs> here. Older people think it's awful to say tune instead of tune. Younger people think it's quite normal and natural. Well, I was alerted a bit to this by the fact that many of my students who are educated people uh, are surprised when I point out to them that actually I don't say tune, I say tune. And that the day after Monday is for me Tuesday. Because they say it as Tuesday. And it's as if the day on which they choose things. Election day, Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so what for me is an obvious difference is something rather problematic and difficult for many younger students. We've got the same change with the voiced <coughs> uh, counterparts, J becoming J. Uh, here, I haven't got you any graph for dealing with stress syllables or uh, words like uh, duke, except jury. Uh, this, of course, is a grammatical word because it's a preposition and so on, in conjunction. Uh, so it's not exactly comparable, but you see the blue line, the one in the middle, shows yes, that the younger people do prefer jury rather than jury. And the top line, the purple one, is gradually, taking over from gradually, and the bottom line, uh, we're concerned with the last part of schedule, or schedule, uh, where dual is the ending rather than dual, the traditional one. Steadily upward lines, the younger people are the more likely they are like Jack. We'll come to the beginning of schedule in a minute. Here's another change. Uh, I mentioned this briefly when I'm talking about falcon. We can either have off, short vowel, like in lot, or we can have or, long vowel, as in thought. And uh, perhaps you can see this is another way of presenting the same data, that there is a steady increase in preference for the short vowel, that is, halt, taking over from halt. In the first edition, I discovered that salt was taking over from salt. I decided it wasn't. Uh, a big enough change to be worth changing my recommendations, and I still take that view. What we also have here is a breakdown by region. And you can see that in the south of England, or Long Island is still preferred, halt. In Scotland, they're about equal. In Wales and in the north of England, there's a preference for the short vowel, halt. So it is partly regional. Here's another regional thing. In the south of England, particularly, people tend to insert a T sound in words like chance. That is, they say chance. Fence then becomes fence. This is very widespread in American English, but also in the, particularly in the south of England. Closely with emphasis, it has a simple phonetic explanation in terms of the uh, timing of the movement of the soft palate compared with the movement of the tongue tip, and it's very much to be expected. Nevertheless, I actually ask people to vote about it. It has consequences. Um, it means that the plural of print, prince, is then not different from the son of the king, prince. And people can make jokes about someday my prince will come if they're waiting for their photographs to be delivered. Yes, the, the joke doesn't work for those of us like me who actually make a difference in pronunciation between prince and prince. But that difference that I make is clearly on its way out, it's disappearing. I also asked about a case and in length, which is phonetically comparable, length or length. The other way around, words like puncture. Most people do indeed have a with a K present puncture, but some people leave out either the K plosive or indeed the T plosive. So you can get puncture or puncture, or you can have everything missing, 
puncture, or we can get the whole thing becoming alveolar tongue tip puncture. The last possibility, puncture, makes it the same as punch plus earth, puncture. And that seems to be the up and coming pronunciation of Clarice one. Some, uh, that, that has a slight increase among the youngest people who are using my mind for puncture. Now, a, a difficult matter, I think you're going to have to rely on my voice, I think my microphone battery is giving up. What is the second vowel in words like careless? For Daniel Jones, it was careless. Ness. When <coughs> Gimson took over Jones's English pronouncing dictionary, he remained, he retained this as the main recommended pronunciation. Careless, carelessness. When I came to do longer pronunciation dictionary, I took the view that bit by bit this has changed to thus, and I think the moment has now come to recommend careless over careless. Carelessness over carelessness. <coughs> Clearly, both pronunciations are still around. It's not that one of them is wrong. They're both correct. The question is which is commoner. It's very difficult to ask non phoneticians about this because if you ask people who don't know anything about phonetics, most of them will look at the spelling and most of them will think they say careless. And indeed, that was the majority response from my naive subjects in this survey. We know they're wrong. It's just a matter of observation that people do not actually say careless. When they're singing, yes, they might sing careless. And if you observe hymns in church, people do indeed sing less carelessness, but not in ordinary conversation. So the uh, green line here is wrong. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the older people are wrong, wronger than the younger people. But if we discount that line, you can see this blue line, the top line, is a preference for careless. It does seem that those who have an accurate observation of what they do, uh, more people <coughs> voted for lust than for list, and perhaps that indicates my view in preferring careless in these words. Now here's another easy word. Where do you keep the car? Do you keep it in a garage, as I do? Or do you keep it in a garage? Or do you keep it in a garage? <coughs> well, we can see the red line there going up. That's for those who make garage rhyme with marriage and carriage. And that's clearly the most popular pronunciation among young people coming in. The blue line is my pronunciation, garage or garage, with a strong vowel in the second syllable, not stressed. The green line at the bottom is final stress, as in American English, garage or garage, and that remains very unpopular, less than 10% among all ages. more possible American influence? What about the last two vowels in necessary, as I say? Well, more and more people like necessary. In fact, a clear majority of all age groups like necessary. February, ordinary, not so many of those. More people prefer what I say, February and ordinary. What is important, though, is the adverbs for from ARY. Since I say voluntary, I also say voluntarily. Since I say necessary, I also say necessarily. Since I say ordinary, I also say ordinarily. But these pronunciations are not popular anymore. And even those who say voluntary now more and more say voluntarily. That's the blue line you can see there going on. Voluntarily. And the green line, voluntarily, is falling into disuse. This is a an irregularity coming in, because if you say voluntary, or even if you say voluntary, you wouldn't expect to change the place of the stress when you make it an adverb. But that's what's happening. People say voluntarily. It avoids having so many unstressed syllables. 
Very good influence? Well, yes. Look at that. Lots of people liking vacation rather than vacation. Ah, the youngest voted for schedule, although all the older age groups voted for schedule. So that's a real American pronunciation coming in. Do you know the verb O-G-L-E? It means to leer. I call it to ogle at somebody. Well, the youngest people incredibly voted in favor of ogle. The only dictionary I could find at all that mentions this possibility is, uh, I forget if it's the American Heritage or the Webster's Collegiate, Tenth, possibly Webster's Collegiate, which gives ogle a, a, a alongside ogle. So the only dictionary that recognizes this off pronunciation is an American one. Maybe it's from American English, I don't know. It's a great surprise. And the initial stress princess, again, increasing among the youngest, which is generally considered an American straw. However, there are other words where we get no such influence. Nobody votes for simultaneous. We all like simultaneous. Yeah. Nobody votes much for patronize. We still say patronize. Very few people, as we saw, like garage. I didn't even ask the possibility of regulatory or respiratory or respiratory, because I know nobody uses strong or in those in British English. That's, in fact, the figures for that last word. And you can see that the majority form is respiratory among all age groups. Well, in the uh, summary, I asked some questions. Here are the answers. They're not ones that change over time, at least not the question of scone. We prefer scone, two-thirds of us, one-third of us like scone. For the Japanese, the corn, uh, scorn, uh, actually is sort of ambiguous between the two possibilities. Uh, <coughs> so you're not taking sides, I think. There are the, to repeat the figures for schedule and for the vowel in pair. I wouldn't say that I've answered all the questions I have. There are still some big mysteries. You would think that the two words absorb and observe are the same about whether we have S or Z. <coughs> but they aren't. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, people prefer absorb with Z, but absurd with S. They're both words of Latin origin, <coughs> absolutely comparable words. I don't think there's any anything in the fact that one is a verb and the other is an adjective that would lead us to expect this difference. But it's a big, big, big difference. <coughs> and with a sample size of 2,000, it's an extremely robust difference. Nobody knows the reason why. Well, I've told you some of the findings. I've concentrated on those that are changing over time. Uh, you can, in fact, read all the results already on the World Wide Web if you follow that link. And uh, those of you without access to the web, and everybody anyhow, can wait for the new edition of the Long Pronunciation Dictionary, which will give all these figures, the graphs as well, and will also include the figures from a survey of American English pronunciation preferences carried out by my student, Hugo Stara, uh, who has discovered that Americans, for example, prefer to say congratulate rather than congratulate documented that fact. Uh, that's very nice. Meanwhile, perhaps I can leave you by referring to the summer course that we run every year at University College London. The next one is 7th to the 18th of August next year. Thank you all very much.